What's going on YouTube? This is Levi at Old Iron Off Road out here today banging on this 1972 International Scout and I'm going to show you step by step how to install your own Hamilton fuel injection setup. So before we dive too deep into this thing I just wanted to go over a couple of little tidbits that will probably help you along the way uh, getting ready and preparing for your installation. First off, if you've already made the decision to install a Hamilton kit Hopefully you've done some research. There is lots of information on binderplanet.com. I'll include a link here in the segment for you to click on so you can navigate your way there. Like I said, lots of useful information there that'll really, really, really help you understand how the system functions. And not only that, it'll actually offer you a community type place to ask questions and get feedback. I know a lot of people want to turn directly to Facebook these days on forums and ask their questions, which I'm not going to say it's necessarily a bad thing because it does kind of offer you instant gratification, but there it's too broad of a forum, if that makes sense. And a lot of times you get people that comment on certain situations and scenarios that not necessarily are wrong, but are wrong and don't really know what they're talking about. So there's one resource. Um, and it, even if you haven't made your mind to take the step and dive into fuel injection, again, Go there, scope it out, read through it, form your own opinion, see if it's something you want to try to tackle. And uh, like I said, hopefully give you some insight into what you're getting ready to dive into. The kit that Bill sends comes complete with instruction manuals. Everything, literally everything you need to know about your fuel injection system and how to install it is outlined in these instruction manuals. There's really no need for any confusion if you can read and follow detailed instructions, then I have absolutely no doubt that you yourself can install a Hamilton fuel injection system. All right, so jumping right in. Obviously, the first things we need to do to get this installation underway is going to be remove the carburetor. I've also taken, I've gone ahead and taken care of a few other little odds and ends that will help in the way of speeding this process along. There's a lot of steps that I didn't feel were necessary to cover. Um, specifically removing the carburetor and a few other little things. Um, if you aren't capable of handling those, then you're probably not going to be attempting to tackle a fuel injection install realistically. So um, I am going to, however, go over the things that we have already done just to kind of uh, give you an idea again as a step-by-step -step install and show you little tips that we like to you like to do and a few other little odds and end things that we like to do along with the install just to uh, kind of help tidy it up and uh, make a cleaner look overall so moving right along here we are in the engine compartment as i'd already mentioned we have removed the carburetor previously we've got the throttle body itself we've got the adapter we've got all the appropriate gaskets installed we've got a fuel return we've got a fuel feed we've got the distributor installed We've got the coil, the ignition control module, coolant temp sensor. One item that we do not have installed yet, which I will locate here on the firewall is the map sensor. We'll cover that here in a little bit. Underneath on the exhaust, you will need to have the ability to weld in a bung for the O2 sensor. So here we've got O2 sensor and also if you can see here, the fuel pump has been removed and replaced with fuel pump block off plate. Moving towards the back of the vehicle, we're moving on to the fuel system. Again, as I mentioned earlier, you have a feed and a return. Our return line is here. Obviously, here's our frame mounted fuel pump. Um, the fuel tank does need to have a provision for a return either in the tank or in a vent hose if you possibly can. I do suggest and advise to use caution when using a vent hose for a return because you can actually um, fill your vapor canister in the fire in the uh, excuse me in the quarter panel full of fuel if you're not careful so i suggest doing that at your own discretion typically what we like to do is install our return directly into a port in the tank and for the return all we've done is reused the white poly or uh, excuse me nylon hose that used to go to the charcoal canister in the engine compartment. Now, if you don't want to use your charcoal canister hose and you want to keep your charcoal canister intact, feel free to run a new piece of poly line or run a metal line. Um, for the feed, as you can see underneath here, what we've done 
is ran a piece of nickel copper blend line from here all the way up towards the throttle body itself. Let me see if I can dive in here so you can see. And it stubs out right here just below the valve cover. The reason I like to do that is that way there's not a whole lot of rubber line to replace. Um, and another thing I do suggest is to use a good quality rubber hose. On the pressure side, you need to use fuel injection hose. Anywhere that suction, you can use regular fuel hose. Also on the return side, you don't need to use fuel injection rated hose because fuel injection hose is considerably expense, more expensive than standard fuel hose. Um, again, I do suggest using a high grade um, rubber hose because subpar quality rubber hoses will need to be replaced seasonally at, at pro probably seasonally um, I've seen some last very very little time so use a good quality hose um, again here we just have short runs and this is Gates hose and this is Gates fuel injection hose Gates seems to hold up really well and to replace hoses in the engine compartment we just have those little short sections the nylon hose for our return they'll never need to be replaced obviously it's lasted this direction of the vehicle we've got a short section of hose here a short section of hose here and a short section of hose here and that's pretty much the only hose that's in the vehicle like i said don't i mean if you really feel like you have to you can run a full length of rubber but i really really don't advise it and it's one of the things that really really irks me on these installs so just do a nice job with the fuel system and it'll be good to you all right, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the distributor. Um, that is something that I do feel like we should kind of double back on. As I mentioned, and you've already seen a lot of the hard components of this uh, system have already been installed, but I am going to touch back on the distributor just to clarify one specific thing. Um, if you're having any trouble with installing the distributor and timing the engine, I have a detailed video outlining how to do that. I'll inclu include a link below. Um, the only thing I'm gonna touch on in this video is rotor, reluctor wheel, and pickup phasing. That is definitely one thing that you need to do. With the engine set, top dead cylinder number eight, and the distributor installed, you're gonna want to verify that the rotor is pointing at a certain position on your cap terminal, and you're also gonna wanna double back and verify that the reluctor wheel of the distributor is actually lined up with the magnetic pickup of the distributor. Now, Bill does preset these things, um, and the, the, the reluctor wheel itself is pre-positioned, but for the sake of starting this engine and ensuring that it is in time properly, you need to double back and make sure that the reluctor wheel and the rotor and all that stuff is in a certain position before you lock the distributor down. So to do so, what we've got here is just a Swiss cheesed up distributor cap. We're running a Holly distributor on this one, so we've got a Holly cap. We're going to drop the cap on and make sure that it is locked into its tab. Step up on the tire here, the stool's not tall enough. So, and what we're looking for is the center of the, or the edge of the cap, the trailing edge of the rotor needs to be just past or just clockwise of the center of the number eight terminal. And then, which you can see it is, I think you can see that it is. And then we're gonna remove the cap and we're gonna double check that the reluctor wheel is in line with the little metal tab on the magnetic pickup, which it is. So that's the only real thing that you're gonna wanna double back and check once you've got everything in time. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we covered that. So now that we've got all the hard components of the kit installed, we're gonna jump onto the part that's probably the most nerve wracking or the most seemingly daunting task of this entire setup which is the wiring. So these harnesses come pre-bundled. Everything's labeled. Everything can only plug up in one direction. But what we're gonna address is this squid looking, octopus looking thing here. Now you can totally lay this out on your engine if you would like and you can double these back in their loom and twist and turn and tape and route and plug this stuff up and your system will absolutely 100% run.
But we, what we like to do is we like to take these harnesses and tidy them up a little bit, make them lay on the engine compartment a lot cleaner and make them just a little more aesthetically pleasing for the install. If you really take your time with this, honestly, and you, and you use like a factory four barrel style air cleaner, you can install one of these kits and just to the, to the unsuspecting or unknowing person, when they look under the hood, you won't even know this thing's fuel injected. So without further ado, we're gonna go into a time lapse. I'm gonna rip this harness apart. I'm gonna pull all the loom off and we're gonna get it all stripped down, lay it on the engine compartment, plug everything up where it needs to be and actually start dressing it in and then we'll re-loom it. <laughs> So we've got the wire and harness all wrapped up and I've actually taken the time to go ahead and get it installed on the engine. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick overview of how the, uh, how the harness actually laid in on top of the engine and how everything hooked up. So that'll give you kind of a, a guide for when you're trying to you know, clean up your own harness. Also, I wanna take the time to go over the major connections that need to be made on this system. So here you can see we've turned multiple trunks into one trunk down and one little offshoot that ties onto everything. We do have the map sensor laying here for the purpose of this video. And I know I did mention that I was gonna mount it on the firewall. I actually mount these things under the air cleaner. Um, I don't, you can mount yours wherever though. It really doesn't matter as long as you have a reference hose hooked up to the proper port. So as far as the major connections go that need to be made on this system, there are a couple of options that you may or may not use. Um, just something worth mentioning. There is an AC on reference that when you turn the air conditioning on, it will increase the idle speed. And there is also a speed sensor hookup that depending on whether you have an automatic or a manual transmission, you may or may not want to use. It's not something that's necessary. Typically on the manual transmissions, you wanna use it just because when you're approaching a stop sign and you push in the clutch, the, the quick desail sometimes will actually stall the engine without a speed sensor reference. 
Um, it's not something that's always necessary and it's not something that you always need, but like I said, on a manual, I would suggest going ahead and using it. Um, this one is an auto, so we're not using that and it's a non AC or actually it was an AC truck, but the AC has since been deleted. So we're not using the reference. So those wires are just basically dressed back into the loom. And if anybody ever decides to add those things in the future, they can just hunt them out and hook them up appropriately. But let's get back on track and let's get on to the uh, appropriate connectors or the necessary connectors that are needed to make the uh, system run. So obviously anything that has a plug that is directly related to the throttle body, the only two things that are optional, as I mentioned, are the AC and the uh, speed sensor hookup. So you do have one ring terminal here that you have to connect to the positive terminal of the starter or of the, sorry, coil. You've also got a pink wire here that you need to hook to an ignition on source. On this one, we use the old coil wire. On that wire, you can actually use that same coil trigger even if it is a resisted source. Um, it's relayed, so it doesn't necessarily need full 12 volts to turn the system on and off. So if you still have your factory resistor wire on it, you should be able to hook to that wire with no trouble. You've got a ground that we hook up on the back of the head here. This is all your main system grounds. This is equally as important as any of the other connections on this harness. Obviously without the ground, the system will not run. So you've got the ground, you've got your coil, you've got your, your on off trigger, your small pink wire. Diving down here to the starter, you have a battery wire and you have a crank reference wire. And also dropping down here, you also have your O2 sensor wire. Now, when I was dressing this harness in, I've done enough of these. I know what needs to dive down here to the bottom. So these all get split off and properly routed, routed in. Here you have your fuel pump wire and that's simple enough. I route it along the fuel lines and just tie it up to the fuel lines themselves and actually hook it up to the fuel pump. So that's uh, should be pretty self -explanatory. Jumping into the cab here, I just wanted to get, show you guys what we do with some of the other peripherals that come with the system. Obviously you've got fuse box, you've got two relays, you've got an ignition side and you have a fuel pump relay and you have your computer. We choose to house this in the glove box. Um, it's a good time to go ahead and change out that ratty old cardboard glove box and put a nice one in. Uh, just a nice clean place for everything, tidy up and out of the way. And it, it the way the harness, the way the harness works is it, it fits in really nice. So we've also got your data link connector here and we have our check engine light here on the dash. So without further ado, I believe we're to a point where we can jump in this thing and hit the key and see if it's actually gonna run or not. All right guys, so we're ready to kick the tires and light the fires. I'm gonna give this thing about three key on cycles, check the fuel filter, make sure that it is full of fuel. I am going to double check my fuel lines and make sure that I don't have any obvious leaks. And then we're going to see if this thing will actually start or not. Gonna just visually check my connections, especially on the pressure side. Make sure I don't see any fuel spraying anywhere. The fuel filter is full of fuel. So we're gonna hit this thing and see if it fires up. No joke, no camera tricks, nothing wonky. That was literally the first time that I've hit the key on this. Um, 
you can expect the same results most of the time. That is why it is very important that you make sure that you know how to properly install a distributor on top dead center number eight, and that you phase that uh, the rotor and the reluctor wheel and the magnetic pickup. If you get that right, you can pretty much guarantee that uh, that's, that's gonna be the result. We're not done just yet. Um, even though it is running, we've still gotta do a few other things. We need to completely bring the engine up to operating temp. We need to double check the timing with the timing light, and we need to go through and do the outlined initial setup procedure, which is basically setting the minimum idle speed and adjusting the TPS accordingly. So I'm gonna warm this engine up and then we'll circle back and I'll, uh, I'll put the camera back on and we'll, we'll go through the initial, process, initial setup process together. All right, so we're back here. Engine's been properly warmed up and timed. The way this thing gets timed is the timing bypass connector gets opened and the time and base, the base timing gets set to zero. So what we're gonna do now is we have WIN ALDL loaded on our old school laptop. The older the better. You don't want, I don't think, anything 62-bit. Um, and you don't want 62, 64. Whatever, your computer guys will correct me, I'm sure. Um, old laptop, no firewall, just the plain Jane. Don't even let it connect to the internet. It's going to be your best tool for working on one of these and actually doing the initial setup. That being said, so what, what we're doing now, again, engine's been properly warmed up. Timing's been set. We're gonna put this thing in ALDL mode, which is done by jumpering pin A and B of your diagnostic connector. We're gonna turn the key on, and we're gonna feel to make sure that the IAC has actually driven closed. Um, once the IAC is driven closed, we're actually gonna unplug it. We're gonna come back into the vehicle. We're gonna turn the key off again, and then we're gonna disconnect our connector. So follow with me. Key on, our jumper's in place. I can feel the IAC vibrating. I'm going to unplug it, and I'm going to visually look and make sure that I can see the pencil tip all the way into its bore, which I can. I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna turn the key off, and then I'm gonna remove my jumper. So what that does is that allows the IEC to no longer be in control of the idle. And basically, even if the, when the IEC is all the way closed, you want to obviously make sure that the engine is still maintaining a reasonable idle. All right, again, the IEC plug is disconnected. The jumper's removed from the ALDL plug, and, or the diagnostics plug. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna adjust the idle screw till it maintains a good solid minimum idle speed without any assistance from the IEC. Don't be surprised at this point when you go to start it if the engine does not start. Um, again, the, the IEC is no longer in control of the airflow. So you may have to have an assistant rest their foot on the throttle just a little bit to crack the butterflies open enough to get enough air to maintain an idle. Or if you're by yourself like I am, just go ahead and run the idle screw in a little bit and then back it off from there. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and bring that up just a little bit. And don't go crazy when you're adjusting these things open. The butterfly should never be any more open than maybe like a sheet of paper in between the bore of the throttle body and the actual blade.
right around 600 RPM. I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so now we're gonna hook the IEC connector back off, back up, I'm sorry. Um, we're gonna disconnect the battery to clear any fault code from the IEC not being enabled. Wait about 10 seconds. We're gonna hook the battery back up. And then we're gonna jump over here to the computer. We're gonna adjust the, the throttle position sensor. And I'm gonna let you guys watch the screen as I'm adjusting it so we, until we get it into spec. All right, so here we are. Um, we've got our computer, our computer screen pulled up. We can see here that we've got a blinking 20, which indicates that there's communication between the laptop itself and the computer. I'm not gonna dive into the setup of the WIN stuff. Um, you know, there's a, a detailed instruction booklet. That may be a video for another day. Um, there are some steps to go through to get the actual software set up. Again, we'll dive into that possibly another video for another day. All we're here for right now is the TPS. Um, our spec, I believe, is 0.54 volts, um, which plus or minus point uh, what is it two one hundredths of a volt or so anywhere from 0 0.56 to or i'm sorry 0 0.52 to 0.56 so we are actually still in spec right now we're setting at 0.2 percent um i'm gonna cycle the throttle blades open a couple of times and actually let you see those numbers change and make sure they do return to within spec Yeah, we're still setting at 0.2%. So there's no adjustment needed on my end here. I'm gonna leave that be. You may or may not have to adjust the uh, TPS to get it within the spec. Um, usually they're pretty close. Um, and also I have ran into instances where um, you actually have to take the TPS and do a little bit of modification around the ears of it so you get just a shade more adjustment out of it. Doesn't happen all the time, but it is something that you do potentially have to deal with. Um, so right now, we're looking good. Everything's functioning. We've gone through our initial setup. I'm going to fire this thing up one more time, let it settle into its IEC controlled idle, see how the throttle responds, and we may be calling it. steps to the install hopefully you feel like you guys have learned something um, any questions you have you know obviously Bill has a has great customer support for the system he's very knowledgeable obviously he's been putting these kits together for years if you have any questions always comment feel free to comment um, I'd love to get some feedback on the videos that we're putting up and also please like and subscribe enjoy <laughs>